together. And in the New Testament, there are these statements. I, I think I might have a little bit of an echo. It probably is the, the monitor. So turn, turn that down. Thanks so much, Lee. You're so good at that. Thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the things, if you look through the Bible, it, it has a lot to say about a relationship with God vertically. But it also has tons to say about our relationships with each other. And there are kind of two words that pop up with different words attached to them. They have different angles to them and they have different directions. And that phrase is one another. And so we're going to be unpacking over the next couple of weeks the one, some of the one another's of the Bible. Today we're, we're starting with the big E. Love one another. And uh, there, there are a few more coming up. Uh, here we go. Today we're going to talk about loving one another. Next week, we're going to look at forgive one another. That's going to be a toughie. God's going to do some hard work on us there. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm really glad. I'm really excited for that because it's so necessary. We all have those pockets where uh, it's tough to experience and grant that forgiveness to each other. Uh, week number three, we're going to look at encouraging one another. It's going to be a really positive week where we think about how we can practically encourage people and then bear with one another. How we carry one another's burdens. So as you can tell, this is a series about relationships. And uh, so I want you to be thinking right now. I want you to be thinking over this, examining, taking stock of your relationships. Because a lot of those relationships have challenges. Uh, like I know that there have got to be marriages here in our midst where you're going through some real challenges right now. Where maybe it's, there's misunderstanding. Maybe there's coldness. Maybe there's distance and something needs to happen. And I'm praying that somehow through the series that that match would be struck again. And you, you'd just be able to realize, both of you, that, that, that it's worth working on. And a, a new appreciation and gratitude and some practical steps to be able to draw close together. And I'm praying the same thing for families. It could be like siblings. Could be grown or could be growing up in the same household right now. Could be between parents and kids or it could be your, your aging parents or it could be a, a, like a brother or sister who's you've grown estranged to and I'm praying that God reconciles through this. It could be a friendship and, uh, and, and maybe for you those friendships are lacking in your life. There might not be enough people in your life and I'm praying that God gives us tools to be able to grow those friendships that we desperately need to battle the loneliness that sometimes we face. Then there's also, uh, above all, I want to be talking about the family of God. Because that's where, I, I want to be honest, that's where a lot of these one another's are directed to. God's talking to people who believe in Jesus and, and he calls them brothers and sisters. And how can we be an effective and a loving family of God? So I'm looking forward to this. But relationships are challenging. One of the kind of parables to me about what that looks like came from a news story in England. And again, this could have happened to, to anyone. But uh, it started with this line. A heartfelt commiseration to Dorothy Naylor of Plymouth, whose recent day trip to Bridgewater was spoiled when her husband Oliver left her in a garage and drove 17 miles before noticing his wife was not in the car. Okay, right? And, and as, they were, as they were interviewed after this, I couldn't believe that he left without me, she said. I usually sit in the back. I don't know what's up with that, but she explains that it's because she feels freer back there and she can move around more. I don't know what that is. But normally they talk to one another, but something happened that this couple who are both in their 70s, I mean, you know, they, they, they passed through a lot of seasons together, right? They, 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 they were there to change a the tire. And Mr. Naylor, he just drove off and he didn't notice for 17 miles until he arrived in the next town. And after stopping in this town, he turns around and he asks his wife, where do you want to get out? And when she didn't answer, he turns around and he discovers that she's not there. She's not there. And the, they were been married for 40 years. But, I, you know, I, I think that's funny. I think it can happen to anybody. But I think it's also a little bit of a, a parable about how relationships can get strained. And uh, I, I'll say this. Um, and this is not to point the finger at marriages or relationships. It's true for friendships. It's true for families. 
Um, sometimes we leave each other behind. And this series is about getting it together and loving one another and making sure we don't leave each other behind. Making sure we don't forget about each other. Making sure that, that, that we're, we're in this car together and we're going on the same road to the same place. Jesus spoke about relationships. And he speaks into your relationships. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn with me to John chapter 13. And there are two verses there that I'd like to highlight today. John chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35. So Jesus, this, this is after he, this is in the middle of a number of statements where Jesus is saying, I'm going to be leaving you soon. And I want to give you some tools to be able to thrive when I leave. And so this is what he said to them. He said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I've loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now, the first thing I think of is why would Jesus have to say this? You know, part of me says, well, it's just obvious, right? We're supposed to love one another. Well, then I start thinking, you know, Jesus wouldn't have said this if it was easy. Jesus wouldn't have said this if it was natural to love one another. And so then I realize, oh yeah, Jesus is speaking into a world of conflict, where people are angry with each other a lot of the time, where people don't talk to one another, where relationships are strained, where there are clashing personalities, where there's jealousy, and all sorts of stuff like that. It's like, oh yeah, we need to hear this again. We need it. And uh, the, the first thing Jesus says is that I'm giving you a new commandment. And uh, this is interesting from Jesus, right? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't, although Jesus respects and builds on the commandments of the Old Testament, we don't often think about Jesus as a commandment giver, do we, right? We often think of him as someone who loves and, 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 and someone who's looking after the heart. But no, Jesus says there's a commandment here, right? There are, there are things to obey. There are things to do. There's a road to walk. But when he gives this commandment, it's an incredible commandment. I mean, when you think about the commandments of the Old Testament, what does your mind think of? Well, you think about the dietary laws, right? Don't eat this. And do eat that. You think about the, there are laws for everything, it seems, about how you dress and where you go and what you do on different days of the week. They're about moral codes. They're, they're about clear rules. They're about punishments for transgressions. They're about religious rules, about how to worship properly. The Old Testament's full of them. But Jesus says, okay, here's the commandment. Love one another. Love one another. And so I feel like just even in the midst of this, Jesus is totally transforming that discussion about what does God really want from me? A different answer than the, the typical answers of religion. It's this, love one another. That's what he wants. And, uh, and, and Jesus says that love is proof of something. That love is proof that you want to know if you're following me. You want to know if you're getting it right. You want to know, you want to have a benchmark or a measure of how close that you're getting to God. And the answer surprises, right? It's like, it's, you would think, oh, it's how often I go to church. Or you would think, oh, you know, like how morally good am I keeping my name out of the papers, out of the rumor mill, right? Keeping my nose clean, not doing anything wrong. And those things are all good things, okay? There, don't get me wrong on that one. But Jesus says, here's where it begins. This is the most important thing, love. Love one another. And so in a sense, Jesus is saying, I want you to be like me. Tall order. But Jesus gives us help in doing that. And then the other thing that Jesus talks about is, this is what the world is watching for. The world is watching and waiting for love. And uh, we're going to unpack that in just a couple of moments. But I also want you to know this, that this love that Jesus is talking about is modeled by Jesus. He's saying, love one another as I have loved you. 
Jesus embodies love. Jesus defines love. Love isn't a set of principles that you can find in some manual somewhere. It's not in a book. It's not in a philosophy. It's not in a cause. It's not in a religion. Jesus is the source of love. It's in a person. And, and Jesus redefines, he changes the whole notion of what love is. In fact, he's just ju- done that. If you read through John chapter 13, you'll see that Jesus has done something spectacular and unexpected. And as the disciples were coming for dinner, he takes off his outer clothing and takes a basin and a towel and he washes their feet. And they said, it so surprised them so much. Some of them said, uh, don't do that, Jesus. This is freaking us out. You're washing our feet. You're our Lord and you're washing our feet. But Jesus is trying to show them, this is love. This is what love does. Love serves. Love reaches. Love isn't you coming to me and me waiting for that. Love is me going to you and taking the low place and helping. And and, then Jesus is the example of love. I mean, the ultimate example of love that's ever been given in in, in our universe. That love that's the... The proof that you are always, once and for all, loved by God is that Jesus went to the cross and he carried the weight and the shame of your sin and your pain and he hung for you there. He allowed nails to be driven into his arms and his feet. He allowed his his beautiful head to be thrust with thorns, a crown of them. He allowed a spear to be thrust into his side. He allowed himself to be mocked and cursed and insulted. And Jesus, all the time, he wasn't doing that just to give you some example of what it means to be a good moral person, an example of sacrifice. He was thinking of you personally. Every moment that he's dying for you there, he's saying, I love you. I love you. This is for you. This is so you can be right with me. This is so you can have a relationship with me. It's incredible. Why was Jesus known for his love? Well, his love is an incredible love. It's a -a one-of-a-kind kind of love. It's a redeeming love. It brings people back. It changes people's lives. That's why... We want to lead people to Jesus. That's that's our why, to lead people to Jesus so they can have changed lives because Jesus' love redeems. It doesn't leave people where they're at. It doesn't leave them stuck in addiction. It doesn't leave them stuck in loneliness. It redeems people. It changes their story. That's the love of Jesus. It's a sacrificing love. It puts itself in harm's way and and, and it takes the lumps and it bears the weight of pain and it sacrifices. That's what Jesus' love did. It's an unconditional love. Uh, Like one person put it, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. That's an incredible kind of love. And it's it's an enemy love too. It just doesn't love people who love you back. It doesn't love just people who are neat and polite and and, and, uh, don't push your buttons. But it loves enemies. That's what it does. This is an incredible kind of love. So the very first step, if you want to get on board with Jesus' program of loving one another, the first step to love one another is to be loved by Jesus and to know it, to experience that love for yourself. Uh, Some of us, um, this gets opened up, the love of Jesus gets opened up by um, what you experienced in your, your family growing up. And for others, that's a more painful story. But, but I know for me, um, there was a time years ago when, when I shared with someone, they were sharing their, their what we call testimony, that's kind of Christianese for their story of how Jesus has changed their life. And they were talking about how, like, how low they went and how hard their growing up years were. And I mean, I just, I hung on their every word, you know, it's just one of those kinds of stories. And, and this was a good friend. And, and then I talked to them afterwards and I said, yeah, like, like, I, I kind of feel bad. I kind of feel, like, embarrassed or I kind of feel inadequate because, like, my story is, you know, I grew up, my family loved me. And most of them loved Jesus. And, uh, you know, they encouraged me. 
You know, they, 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 they forgave me. You know, they were there. They didn't go anywhere. And I, th- I feel a little like, uh, I don't know what the word was I used. It was something like embarrassed, right, about that. I feel like my story is lesser. And they stopped me right there. They were like angry about this. And they said, stop. Not for one minute should you ever think that your story is inadequate. God's done a work in your life. But you know what? One of the great parts of your story that I love is that you were loved by your family. That you got to taste what love is from your mom and your dad and your sister and your aunts and your uncles and your grandparents. Like you got, you grew up in an atmosphere of love. So you've gotten a taste of what God's love is like. And you need to share that with other people. It's like, I, 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 I'm jealous of you, they were saying. It's like, I wish I could have grown up in that. We need more people who grow up in, in healthy homes where they're loved and they're encouraged and they're supported. I mean, my goodness, like, I remember when uh, I, I phoned my mom and dad about, uh, about said, hey, mom and dad, I'm getting married. And, uh, you know, so those of you who have met Sandra think, well, gee, like, if they had known, it's like, how quickly can you marry her? You need this woman in your life, right? To make something of your life. But I mean, they didn't know her. I think they'd met her once, right? And so most parents would be kind of questioning whether they would say it out loud or not. It's like, are you, are you doing the right thing? Are you making the right thing? Here's what I heard from my parents. Corey, we trust you. She must be an incredible woman. I heard things like that from them. Like trust and encouragement. And I, again, I was just grateful. I thank God, God, thank you for letting me grow up in a family like that, right? That gave me this taste of what God's love was like. And because I was loved by my family, then that means that it, it, made, it makes it easier to love other people. It makes it easier to open my heart because I perceive that love. Now, for some of you, that is not your story. Your story is a million miles away from that. Your story might be one of hardship, might be one of disappointment or betrayal, things like that. But I want you to know the first step, you know, don't let that, and I know you won't, but don't let that trip you up from this great commandment of Jesus to love one another. It could, right? If you haven't had love poured into you, that could be the biggest roadblock and stumbling block for you loving one another. But the good news this morning, the great news is this, that you don't need to let that stop you. You, There is a love that can be poured into you. There is a love that is stronger than any other human love that you could ever experience. And I know a lot of people back me up on this one. And it's the love of Jesus, right? This kind of love, right? That we just talked about. Redeeming, sacrificing, unconditional, enemy love. That kind of love, if you would open up your life to Jesus, that love will fill your heart He will pour into you and you'll be able to love other people. I I, I really believe that. First step, the first step to love one another is being loved by Jesus. So let's unpack this a little bit more. Who does God want us to love? God wants us to to love each other, right? The family of God. And this is shop talk here today, but the people that you see, you know, sitting in the row in front of you and the row behind you and, you know, in this room and maybe the people that go to the other service, They are the family of God to you. They are your brothers. They are your sisters. And I think it's really important that love begins here. Love begins at home, right? And and this is our spiritual home. And the kind of community we want to be to each other, the kind of community we want to be known for is, wow, those people love each other. That's been true for about 2,000 years. That people have been able to say of the church, the family of God, wow, they love each other. And it's been attractive. That's what we need to be. But, you know, that might not be what we're known for. It might not be, uh, we not, might not be uh, aver- you know, uh, true to as we're built in terms of advertising. Um, there was a guy who, uh, as a result of poor planning, uh, needed some same day dry cleaning done before he left on a trip. And he, and he remembered, oh yeah, there's that place. You know, on that street across town with that sign, that huge sign that says one hour dry cleaners. And so he drove all his way across town to drop off a suit. And after filling out the tag, the clerk said, uh, he told the clerk, he said, I need this in an hour, of course. 
And she said, well, I can't get it back to you till Thursday. Well, he said, I thought you did dry cleaning in one hour. No, she said, that's just the name on the store. <laughs> isn't that crazy? Yeah, but it's true, isn't it, right? And I think that could be true of a family. Let's not let that be true of the family of God. Where, yeah, of course, those people who follow Jesus, they're supposed to love each other, but that's just the name on the door, right? You take a peek inside, and it's not like it's been advertised. The church was made to be a loving family. And, and there, like the whole New Testament is filled with encouragements to this. Here, here's one. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Love the body. There's a word, koinonia. It's fellowship. It's togetherness. It's love. It's heart love. We are brothers and sisters to each other. But it doesn't end there. We gotta love like God loves. And if we're gonna love like God loves, that means that your mission is to invite, is to love people into the kingdom of God. That's how God wants you to love one another. It begins here at home, but then it reaches out to others. Your mission is to invite people into the kingdom of God. And you do that with your words. You speak the words of God to people. You speak prophetic, encouraging, timely words to people. You do that with your compassion. We do that by sharing with the poor. You do that with mercy. Whenever someone's hurting, when there's been a loss in their family, when there's been a crisis in them, mercy reaches out to them in love and shows them the hands and the feet of Jesus. You do that with your generosity. You surprise people with love. I mean, people who follow Jesus have been doing that for a long time now, but it's like, it's just the surprise help, the thoughtful gift, some unexpected surprise. You do that with your friendship and your presence. You know, love sometimes looks like a cup of coffee. And sometimes love looks like, I don't know, in my life, like inviting someone over for the game. Your friendship, you love one another that way. And as you love them, you invite them into the kingdom of God. Love means sharing possessions with one another. You know, it, it could mean, you know, you got power tools, you loan them to the guy across the street, right? It's power tool sharing faith, right? Or maybe it's your interest, or maybe it's expertise. That's how we do it. Um, grab the power of love. To invite people in the kingdom of God. Uh, I'm reminded of a mom. And one day, like, uh, she was involved in church. And, and uh, she was involved in leading worship. And she had had a rough week. And she was having a rough morning. I mean, it's one of those mornings you wake up. It's like, this is going to be a bad day. I can feel it in my bones. She was thinking. Right? And, and I mean, you know, especially if you're going to be up front in front of people. Right? And not pretend and be authentic. Uh, you know, what do you do in a, in a situation like that? What's going to change things, right? And, and you begin to, your head gets screwed on wrong and think about the wrong things and you sort of, you know, feel bad about yourself and you retreat inward and it goes all wrong. Anyway, she, she got up and she felt spent. However, her eight-year-old daughter, Brenna, got up before her. And uh, I don't know what she had been given maybe for Christmas, you know, one of those markers that works on windows, you know, that you can do a little graffiti on, yeah? And, and, and so she, she went in and, and, and she saw that her daughter got away before her and uh, wrote down, like, one of her favorite Bible verses. And uh, it, it was something like this. She started to list what we would know as fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, she spelled that wrong. Patience, she got that one right. I don't know how she did that. Uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? And, 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 you know, it just warmed her heart. And she stopped and she drank it in. And her heart flooded with light. It was exactly what she needed to be reminded about. On her picture window. And then she noticed one more thing that made her laugh and uh, filled her heart with even greater joy. Because scrawled in the corner of the window was another Part of a Bible verse, the one that we were looking at this morning, love one another, except here's how she spelled it, love one another. And in that little phrase, 
that she got wrong, she got everything right. Because your mission here on this earth is to invite people into the kingdom of God and you do that by loving them. And that was the story of how I came into the kingdom of God. And I have to believe that was the story about how you came into the kingdom of God. Love won you over. And so live in such a way with the compassion and mercy and friendship to others that love wins another. Love one another. Love uh, should hold the first place. Jesus said that over and over again. Uh, you know this verse. I, I barely need to even share it with you. Where Jesus said this. Uh, someone asked him, what's the most important commandments? Which comes first? And here's Jesus said. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Love, right? This is the first and greatest commandment. First step. First place. And then he says, and not to denigrate, but this is the source of all the loves. But here's the next one. It flows right out of it. It comes right along with it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love, right? Love one another and be loved by God. I'm praying today that, that God uses this to transform that marriage that's struggling right now. And I want you to be dreaming right now and asking God to prompt you, God, how do you want me to love my partner better this week? What can I do to show them in a practical way your love? How can I go the extra mile? I want you to think about that. You know, children to your parents, parents to your kids. You know, we get stuck in our routines. We get stuck in our habits, too, about how we talk to each other, how we treat one another. How can you kick out of that routine and love each other in a different, special way? How can you show that person that you love them? Think about a friendship. Think about somebody here in this body, some brother or sister in Jesus. Here's what it's all about. God is the source of love. And you want God to pour his love into your life. That's where it all begins. Jesus is the proof of that love. As I have loved you. He died for you on the cross. He went the distance for you. And you are the agents of love in this world. Let's take that role, that job, seriously. And let's pray together now. God, we can't love without your help. Our love uh, doesn't last long and it's hollow and we struggle to make it sincere. But with your help, God, we're believing that it can be better. We're believing that you can help us to be able to, to love authentically and generously and pour ourselves out. But Lord, today I do pray, Lord, there must be someone here today that needs their love, needs love to be poured into them. They're feeling drained, they're feeling at the end of their own strength, and they're feeling hollow. God, as they open their heart up to you, would you pour your love into them? That love that took you to the cross, that love that walked this earth and healed and welcomed those who were abandoned. Lord, take them in and love them back to you. Father, I pray that you would help us to love one another. In Jesus' name.